Hello, uh, NASIS 2020. Thanks to Wenfei for the intro. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting today some work by uh, myself. Um, as Wenfei said, I'm Eric Robsky huntley uh, I teach at the, in the MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning, um, along with my colleagues, Christopher Alton, who's at Ryerson, and Zuleika Ayub, um, who's at Princeton. Um, and um, because at this point in a fully Zoomed semester, I'm tired of listening to myself speak, I'm gonna cede the first minute or so of my talk to some folks who can speak to certain things better than I can. We're here outside the world's largest mining convention. Toronto has shown out by the hundreds to say no to the business as usual of this industry. We will not allow their ongoing colonization, land theft, violence, environmental destruction to continue. PDAC itself estimates about 25,000 attendees are joining them this year from at least 130 countries. Um, at least 30% of the attendees, they say, come from outside Canada. So this is truly a global conference. Toronto is the global capital of mining finance and Canada in general is the global hub of mining. Um, over two-thirds of mining companies around the world are based here in Canada so we're right here in the belly of the beast. Their business as usual is a world where the rights of capital always take precedence over human rights. We're here to um, disrupt as much as we can uh, because there are indigenous communities all over the world impacted uh, by these companies. All of these corporations are connected to the larger infrastructure of resource extraction. Extractive companies think they can hide in this convention center and literally give each other awards for corporate social responsibility, for sustainability. They are holding glitzy galas all this weekend and this week to literally celebrate each other's greenwashing and charitable efforts. Um, so we just heard from uh, both Vanessa Gray, uh, who's an Amjinan uh, land defender, and Rachel Small, who's with a group called um, the Mining and Justice Solidarity Network. And the work that I'm gonna be presenting today is some work that um, a group that I'm a member of called Graphy did in collaboration with both the Mining and Justice Solidarity Network and a group um, called Beyond Extraction out of York University. And what we're gonna be doing is, is trying to take these two statements from that previous video very seriously. First, that corporations that exhibit at exhibition at um, conventions like PDAC are indeed connected to the larger infrastructure of resource extraction that um, at this point operates at a planetary scale and that um, extraction companies use conventions such as PDAC as a way of both disguising and legitimating um, certain forms of extractive expertise. Um, so obviously we can't talk about extraction without um, re recognizing the, the degree to which um, it is bound up with uh, ongoing land theft and the exploitation of indigenous lands. Um, I'm joining from uh, Somerville, uh, which is on the unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. Um, and the work I'll be presenting was largely carried out on the expropriated lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, and I'll just note that in the words of Eve Tuck and Kei Wen Yang, um, decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, decolonization means land back. Um, so we, uh, the, so um, this, this project is um, part of a larger collection of, of events that we uh, ran um, February 27th through uh, March 4th, um, right uh, this past year, right, right there under the, under the COVID, under the COVID wire. Um, and um, so we, we received a, a Antipode Foundation um, Scholar Activist International Workshop Award um, to put together a large plenary town hall. A, the, the rally that you saw um, in that video is partially supported by, by this um, fund. Um, we had arts installations and a lot of stuff happening. Um, but the thing that I'm going to be focusing in on um, is uh, some of the uh, critical cartography workshops that we ran at this counter conference and the um, and some of the uh, ongoing work that that Graphy is doing to um, develop a sort of cartographic language and and tool to visualize um, uh, 
what um, what some have called the planetary mine. Um, and I'm not going to dive into human geography theory land here for for too long, um, but I will just acknowledge that we're we're drawing heavily on the um, the framework of the planetary mine, which has been uh, developed by Mason Laban and Martin Arboleda. Um, um, the basic insight, the sort of rundown here, is essentially that um, they're making the claim that. Um, mining, extraction, et cetera, um, can no longer be understood as tied specifically to um, extractive sites, but that they have to be understood in relation to uh, networks of infrastructure, um, bodies of expertise, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, so the, just tip of the hat where the tip of the hat is due um, before we dive into the mapping. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna be talking about are these um, critical uh, cardo corporate research workshops as I, I've written it here. Um, the idea here was that at this counter conference, which was organized alongside the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, um, we would lead a group of people through a research practice that outlined a way of digging up the dirt, essentially, on um, the way that um, the way that extractive companies offshore work through shell companies have all kinds of complicated subsidiary relationships and that sort of thing. So um, we. Again, we ran this um, in early March. Uh, these are my colleagues, Zuleika and Chris, um, at that workshop. Um, and in brief, we we showcased a couple of public databases um, that uh, the Canadian government, or um, at this point, private contractors in some cases run, that allow you to look up fairly in-depth information on the um, corporate structure and holdings of um, mining companies. Uh, the first being the System for Electronic Document Analysis and Retrieval, this, or CDAR. The second being the System for Electronic Disclosure by Insiders, or SETI. Um, these are not screenshots from 1992. Um, these are screenshots from yesterday. Um, to give you a sense of the kind of uh, public investment that's gone into making these things um, uh, readable by a broader public. Um, I don't think it takes too much unreasonable speculation to, to um, think to, uh, to come to some conclusions as to why there might not be a whole lot of interest in making these things very usable. Um, in short, uh, we walked workshops, we walked workshop participants through digging through what are called annual information forms. These are annually required reporting documents filed by companies that document their internal organizational structure, which means that you can track down subsidiary relationships between um, large mining firms and um, smaller subsidiaries, eventually tracing them all the way down to um, the, the level of the mine. Um, so there was no way we had like 25 participants. There was no way we were going to um, sort of do a full um, network network analysis pass at um, sort of mining relations, corporate mining relations. But what we did do um, is walk through a um, walk through a. Uh, a workflow whereby essentially folks um, combed the web. Um, for things like listed business addresses, along with those that are listed in the in the disclosure forms, um, uh, and and um, uh, and uh, did did research on on the location of these firms, um, their relationship to to parent companies, and the like. Um, in advance, we'd gone through and scraped the entire PDAC website for all of the information that we could get. Um, so that was essentially, you know, um, listing um, firm name, uh, which booth they were going to be in at the conference, um, you know, and I'll, that that kind of thing. Where what countries they operate in, um, and I'll just point out that one of the prominent um, firms exhibiting on the trade floor was none other than our very own uh, Esri. Um, um, which maybe explains why we turned to an alternative and took took. Um, took participants through a workflow using both QGIS and um, OpenCage, which is a sort of meta geocoder that runs um, queries against many uh, open source geocoders, um, to, uh, to produce a series of flyers that we could then distribute as part of, um, as part of protest actions. Um, so these are these are workshop participants who'd never done any mapping before. So there was a lot of template providing. We you know, shared um, we shared, you know, pre-projected maps and and this kind of thing. But the idea was that by the end of the by the end of the exercise, folks had a skill that allowed them to produce um, some kind of punchy graphics depicting um, depicting um, um, inter inter uh, firm relations. And I'll I'll just say also, um, I'm not holding this up as my point of exemplary cartography today. So please hold your carto critique um, for uh, subsequent materials. These are sort of the the quick and dirty flyers that we put together at this workshop. 
Um, so following the workshop, um, we turned to um, we turned to uh, this project of how do we how do we take what we've learned in the course of doing this research and begin to represent it in a way that doesn't just um, in a way that doesn't just uh, sort of blandly depict research, blandly depict points, but um, tells us something both about the Con convention center as a site and its context in the city of Toronto. Um, and the first thing that I'll talk about is the difficulty of working with volume um, in, in cartography. Um, so, you know, we were right on, we were right in downtown Toronto, this protest that closed down um, the convention center for four or five hours um, was, was right on, right next to the CN tower. Um, and um, this is, this is not a, this is not a, um, this is not a smoothly varying or a uh, or a relatively flat plane. Um, these are large buildings with with masses, shadows, the like. And furthermore, that you know we're we're working in a place where you know it's a city, right? There are underpasses, there are tunnels, there are there are different kind of volumetric areas that make um, that make conventional cartography somewhat um, that left that made cart conventional cartography leave something to be desired. Um, so you know we we started working with things like Mapbox. I mean. 3D, 3D um, buildings are at least pretty easily available. But, you know, Mapbox, I love y'all, but built form is not the same as an extruded building footprint. Um, and I, we sort of quickly got a little dis, 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 disenchanted with um, available offerings from um, some of the major interactive map um, providers. Um, similarly, you know, we, we started thinking about modeling the conference center using like the indoor Apple indoor mapping format, but I'm, it, it seems to be built it felt like it was built much for, more for a um, for you know mall mapping, airport mapping than for um, than for the type of use case we were thinking about. So we turned ultimately to um, 3D models. Um, the uh, City of Toronto's Planning and Development Department makes a um, massing model publicly available. So blessedly, 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 we didn't have to do any of this. Um, the uh, the um, the buildings were modeled in detail with detailed floor plates as they hit the edges of the structures. Um, the CN Tower was was um, was uh, there and and uh, well depicted. Um, but we turned to these things um, because uh, we we wanted that kind of architectural and urbanistic um, detail that tends to get lost when you turn to um, vector tiles as they exist right now. And so, in, to an extent, um, and this is the this is a rendering of what would become our base map, or this is our base map, um, uh, or this is what would become our base map, my goodness. Um, um, so maybe in, in some sense, this is a defense of the humble raster tile. After all these years, we did end up just producing um, raster tile sets um, depicting uh, rendered, uh, rendered, um, uh, rendered structures. Um, so finally, um, we did a lot of work to uh, what we think of as unhiding the convention center. So we dug up architectural plans um, for the Metro Toronto Convention Center. We georeferenced these convention center plans, ultimately arriving at the exhibit hall floor. Um, and this was aided uh, to a great degree by uh, the uh, Canadian architect, uh, September 1997, shout out, um, who published a several page article on this new convention center, which meant that we were able to do, um, you know, we're still in the process of building this out, but we were able to build an architectural model of the interior that we could then work into our, our map in the same way. Um, and uh, the last thing that we the last thing that we did to sort of give give some additional flavor as far as the experience of being on the convention center floor um, was do um, do sort of we we captured the entire convention center floor using um, a, a Steadicam mounted GoPro. Where by Steadicam, I really mean uh, my friend, or my colleague Zuleika um, was at that point in a wheelchair after breaking her foot. Um, so in this case, disability was a superpower and we were able to um, wheel a GoPro unnoticed through the convention center floor. And I'll say also that our point was not to um, dox anybody. We ran this whole video through um, uh, OpenCV object detector and blurred everybody and which is basically working. Um, so at the end of the day, our obligatory slacks, stack slide, I'm not gonna dig into it, um, except to say, you know, a lot of, a lot of different, um, a lot of different workflows went into this project, which led to, I think, some, some interesting, um, some interesting visualization possibilities. And I'll now turn to the tool as it stands. Um, 
So this is this is what we're working with right now, and I'll just refresh it. It's not yet publicly available. Um, it's you'll notice I'm hosting it on the well-known service provider localhost. Um, but the idea here is essentially that in the middle, in the middle, we get a um, plan cut of the convention center floor, which allows us to navigate these booths. Um, and uh, click on them as, as need be, um, at which point you get both some information about the booth and the video of the booth at that, at that point on the floor with the ability to, for example, um, pan back and forth on this video. It's a little rusty right now. It's, pan, it's a scrubbing on an MP4, which is not the fastest thing. Um, but that's, that's the idea that we can sort of do this user interaction that allows the user to um, view um, the sort of visual rhetoric, the advertising that, that goes with making mining possible. And on the right here, for any one of these selected booths, um, you get a, uh, because we're three designers, obviously a Dymaxion map of, um, of all of the countries in which they have active exploration projects. So here we're looking at Newmont Corporation, who are exploring sites in these these countries. So this is obvious. This is a work in progress, um, but as a first pass at providing some kind of um, uh, public access, maybe to a um, to a convention hall that um, is uh, that is um, rather rather deliberately locked. Um, we uh, we hope that it's uh, we hope that it's. Uh, yeah, we hope that it's going somewhere interesting. And I, I think, you know, we can talk a little bit about the, the way that the urban representation does or does not work. I think the scale of the, the scale of the, of the base tiles was not necessarily as well matched to the scale of the conference floor as we thought, but um, that's, that's, that is what it is. Um, so, so much, Eric. yep, yep. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will. I will stop there. Thank you, Winfrey. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, that was a really cool talk, and there are a lot of comments in the Slack. But I feel like for the uh, for the sake of time, uh, we should move on to the next. Uh, we should move on to the next speaker.